If you've watched my Imjin War series, you already know the story of Toyotomi Hideyoshi's later years. His invasion of Korea, an attempt to conquer China, an extremely costly campaign that began in 1592 and ended with Hideyoshi's death in 1598. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the civil war that took place in Japan following Hideyoshi's death and at some unique relics from that time. Relics that give us a tangible connection to the past. The Blood Ceilings of Kyoto. All right, so here we have Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the man who ended Japan's more than century-long period of civil war in the 15th and 16th centuries. It was Hideyoshi who completed the unification of Japan, dominating all its daimyo lords, all its rival fiefdoms, and forging them into a single nation. He completed the job of unifying Japan in 1591, and in 1592 he tried to seize even more. He invaded Korea and tried unsuccessfully to conquer China. And in 1598 he died. Prior to his death, Hideyoshi appointed five regents to govern the country after he was gone, to hold Japan together until Hideyoshi's only surviving son and heir, five-year-old Hideyori, became old enough to take over. This arrangement, five powerful and ambitious daimyo lords governing on behalf of one young child, was doomed to fail. Almost from the moment that Hideyoshi was dead and buried, the five regents and their allies began forming alliances and jockeying for position behind the scenes. By 1600, two rival camps had formed. A western camp, led by Ishida Mitsunari, that was loyal to the heir apparent Hideyori, and an eastern camp, led by Tokugawa Ieyasu, the most powerful of the five regents. The inevitable civil war between these two sides began in the summer of 1600. In one of the preliminary engagements, Ishida Mitsunari lay siege to Fushimi Castle just south of Kyoto, which was held by 1,800 men under Tori Mototada, one of Tokugawa Ieyasu's most loyal vassals. Tokugawa himself was away in northern Japan with the bulk of his army, leaving Tori and his garrison badly outnumbered when Ishida's 40,000-man army arrived and attacked. Tori and his men nevertheless succeeded in holding out for 11 days, from August 27th to September 8th. By the eighth day, Tori was down to just 200 men, many of them wounded, all of them exhausted. But they kept fighting. Over the next two days, Tori led the survivors in five suicide charges out of the castle, attacking Ishida's forces like demons and making them pay a heavy price. It's said that Ishida lost 3,000 men altogether. Finally, when the Fushimi garrison was completely wiped out, Tori and his family committed suicide inside the castle, some of which was now in flames. Tori cut open his belly, the act of seppuku. His wife slashed open her throat. Tori Mototada's self-sacrifice at Fushimi Castle played a crucial role in Tokugawa Ieyasu's subsequent victory in Japan's civil war. By keeping Ishida's army tied up for 11 days, Tori gave Tokugawa time to move his forces into position for the decisive Battle of Sekigahara on October 21, 1600. Tokugawa won that battle and went on to found the Tokugawa shogunate that would rule Japan for the next two and a half centuries. And Tori Mototada, his suicide became one of the most celebrated acts of seppuku in Japanese history. When the damaged Fushimi Castle was finally demolished in 1623, 
Tokugawa Ieyasu ordered that the floorboards of the corridor where the act took place, still deeply stained with blood, be preserved. These floorboards were distributed to several Kyoto area temples in the years that followed, and were incorporated into the structures when they were rebuilt. They weren't used as floorboards, however. Instead, they were used in ceilings to show proper respect. These are the Chi Tenjo, the blood ceilings of Kyoto. There are five of them that are known for certain. In Kyoto itself, at Genkoan Temple, Shodenji Temple, and Yogenin Temple. In the village of Ohara to the north, at Hosenin Temple, and at Koshoji Temple in Uji to the south. Myoshinji Temple in Kyoto and Jino Uji Temple in Yawata are also said to have blood ceilings, but I haven't been able to verify these. If any of you have any information on the blood ceilings in these two temples, please let me know in the comments. Okay, so let's visit some of these temples and take a look at their blood ceilings. First up, Genkoan Temple in northwest Kyoto. First established in 1346, rebuilt in the late 1600s. That's when the boards from Fushimi were incorporated into the main hall. Here it is, Genkoan's blood ceiling. See all those discolorations in the boards? All those dark stains? That's blood, more than four centuries old, soaked deep into the wood and turned brown with age. Of all the blood ceilings in and around Kyoto, this one at Genkoan bears the most recognizable marks. Clearly defined footprints. See them? There's one. And there's another. And another. As with all of Kyoto's blood ceiling temples, Genkoan does not attract a lot of visitors. So if you take the time to go there, you'll have the place almost all to yourself, which makes the experience of viewing the blood ceilings even more enjoyable. Genkoan, incidentally, is also known for its pair of Zen windows, the square window of delusion, symbolizing human suffering and ignorance, and the round window of realization, symbolizing enlightenment. Okay, let's move on to Shodenji Temple, also in northwest Kyoto. It's not much more than a 30-minute walk between Genkoan and Shodenji, so they can be easily visited together in one outing. Shodenji's blood ceiling is located above a veranda, looking out on the temple's renowned Zen garden. There are no remarkable footprints on it, like at Genkoan. What Shodenji offers instead is handprints. Lots of handprints. Look at this shot. What do you see? To me, this appears to be the spot where a samurai warrior, perhaps Torimoto Tara himself, experienced his death throes. He was seated here. And all these surrounding marks, his bloody hands, as he struggled to support himself after making the terrible cut across his belly. This is all just my interpretation, of course. But that's the great thing about Kyoto's blood ceilings. They're like an old-time TV broadcast that's mostly just static. But if you try, if you open your mind, you can make out ghostly images, like gazing through a portal and actually seeing the past. Let's finish up with a trip north of Kyoto to Ohara and Hosenin Temple. Here it is, a beautiful open-sided hall overlooking a tranquil garden. The stains on Hosenin's blood ceiling include fingerprints. At least one footprint and some curious marks that are evidently the imprints of bloody armor. 
There is also a mark that is said to be an imprint of a face. It's the subject of a painting on display in the hall. Is this Tori Mototada's face, preserved in his own blood after he slumped over? Or is it perhaps his wife's face? Elsewhere, on Hosenin's ceiling, is another mark that could be either an imprint of a dead samurai's armor or the imprint of another face. A man's face. What do you think? The blood ceiling at Yogenin Temple in central Kyoto is also said to have an imprint of Tori Mototada's face. Here it is. Well, that's it for the blood ceilings of Kyoto. Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you like this video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks.